Hi everyone, this is Rick again. This time I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the sources of acidity in paper. Last time we talked about what acidity does in, in the initial stages of paper aging. Now we're going to talk about what are the, what are these sources of acidity. Um, to understand that, you have to understand a little bit about paper manufacture. Um, paper is cellulose fiber, but if you ever try to write on like a coffee filter or any unsized paper that you'll have at home, you'll see that you really can't write out. The ink won't stick, it'll run, or it'll just won't come out of the pen. And so what they've done is they, uh, what they do, what scientists have done a long time ago is they invented sizing. One of the first sizings was invented by a German guy in 1807. It was an alum, alum rosin, and we've used alum rosin sizing for a very long time. It was invented by a guy named uh, Moritz Friedrich and he was uh, from a place called Elig in Germany, and this is, like, like I said, 1807. And in the sizing system, um, it's they were it was a byproduct of, of soap making at the time, and it helps the, the rosin bond to the paper. And it also, and the rosin is the thing that makes it, makes the ink um, stick to the paper, and also to spread out sort of evenly without running provides and it also makes the paper sort of semi waterproof which is why we can use my soap and cleaners and things to to clean it without much danger as long as we understand the chemistry that we're applying and we don't use household cleaners so I'm gonna go over that today and I hope you enjoy the video Have fun. so the major source of acidity in paper arises during its manufacture a sizing agent is used to prevent the running of printing ink on paper and in general to introduce the hydrophilic cellulose fibers to a degree of resistance to wetting and penetration by aqueous liquids. So it makes the paper slightly waterproof and it allows the ink to stick to the paper better. And it also let the paper will lay flatter with, with the sizing agent as well. The waterproofing agent that's most commonly used up from you know, 1807 really up until about uh, 1980s was uh, aluminum precipitated rosin. The sizing process involves the introduction of what we call this hydrophobic rosin size, and that's this rosin size here. Let me have, it's this rosin size, that's called a rosin, the size it's called. It's a, sort of a byproduct of soap making actually. By precipitation with paper makers alum. Paper makers alum, alum is aluminum sulfate, which is this substance right here. Um, as with the case with any aluminum salt, and think of like any purse burn or any aluminum medications you ever have to take, they'll, they'll a lot of times have aluminum in them because aluminum just takes in a lot of water. Um, it can go and it goes um, this. Um, this absorption of water to form what we call hexa aqua aluminum three ions. So we're just talking about the aluminum part of the aluminum sulfate. Up above gets even more water and makes this compound and this this is the important part. It makes makes acid. If you want this to look more like a chemical reaction, what it, instead of just me typing it, it looks like this. It looks like um, not that you particularly want it, but it looks like aluminum this is hex aluminum complex plus even still more water if you can believe it it's in equilibrium to form this complex here and it looks like this and this is the important part because this is acid this means acid that's what we're concerned about. Now I say the Ka, and what is the Ka? The Ka is, if we were to call this, just to make the math easier for you, A, B, C, and D, um, the ratio of C times D over A times B is only 1.2 times 10 to the minus five, which means that only about, about one in 100,000 of these will actually form an acid. So only about one in a hundred. This reaction here only happens about one in a hundred thousand times to the right. Most of the time it's going to the left. So there's very little of that done. 
But we say that precipitation of rosin size by aluminum sulfate is more effective in a pH range of 4.2 to 4.8. So even though it's not contributing that much acid, people in the manufacture of paper often did it in a lower pH to make this stuff. So there's just naturally acid all around it too. And this acid environment's required for this part of paper making. It just, they just need it. And it's a primary source of acidity in paper for causing the hydrolysis of the 1,4 beta glycosidic bond in cellulose that we talked about last time. And I also say that water is readily absorbed by paper, about 4 to 10% by weight. So there's plenty of water to go around to help these reactions happen. If you can keep your paper drier, this will happen slower. So therefore, a combination of acid impurities and absorbed moisture can produce acid degradation in cellular fibers in comic books. The other factors, what are some of the other factors? The other factors are include air pollutants and which are some of the major sources are sulfur dioxide, and that's usually from industrial processes, and that makes sulfuric acid. Now, the uh, SO2, for if you live in a regular uh, like a city where there's a lot of industrial processes, you can easily exceed that. And But if you don't live in a big city, you're probably not going to be in the 2 to 9 ppm range. Nitrogen dioxide, however, is from automobile combustion, and we get this combination of nitrogen from the air in your vehicle combined with oxygen and makes NO, and then the two NOs, nitrogen monoxides, combine with more oxygen to make NO2, and that travels around in the air. Once it gets on the paper, the three NO2s mixed with some of the water that we talked about as being dangerous before that makes nitric acid and nitri more nitrogen monoxide, which is another source of the, if you, if it's, in particular, if you see a lot of yellowing, that's probably a source of what you're seeing. The formation of nitric acid would, of course, degrade the cellulose chain, and instead nitrogen dioxide reacts with cellulose mainly by oxidizing the hydroxyl group of the C6 atom. I don't, I'm not going to draw the anhydroglucose unit for you again, like I did last time, but it's just the sixth atom from the right the way I drew it last time, to form something called uronic acid, and it uh, that's a, that's a you know obviously a problem that we have in. The, the uronic acid grouping, as you see here, so it reads the cellulose plus this end chain here plus that NO2 uh, makes this here, and this looks it looks like that. You know, this looks like this is acidic. If you see this group, this this hydrogen pops off. This is kind of like vinegar, and this other stuff we don't really care about. But it that's one of the ways it makes the paper more acidic in the presence of the NO2, even if it's not nitric acid. So the stuff's bad news. If it's nitric acid, it's obviously bad news, but even as NO, you get this degradation. It oxidizes the end of your chains and makes them even more acidic. So there's all kinds of things trying to make paper very acidic, and we don't, we don't like that. So those are some, some of the sources that we have to be careful about. So while oxidation with nitrogen oxide does not usually directly disturb the fiber structure of the cellulose, the, con the conversion of these what we call alcoholic groups to carboxylic acid groups that I showed you will certainly increase the acidity of paper. The use of wood, of wood products, as a source of cellulose fiber and the chemical pulping and bleaching processes that are usually employed in paper making always lead or led in the past to an acidic product. That's why they always say, oh, this is acid-free paper, acid-free this, acid-free back and forth. Well, there's no meaning after like the late 80s, early 90s, but it's important historically for that, for that reason. Before the 1850s, paper was made from cotton and linen rags. They, they often, um, not just ra linen rags and then cotton, were the sources of paper. That's what paper was made of. Obviously, it was vellum before that. And, and they even used uh, papyrus, of course, in ancient times. But these were, these were relatively pure forms of cellulose. They were 90% cellulose at the time. With the invention of, of a paper making machine by the, the Fordriner brothers, Fordriner brothers, I should say, sorry. In 1804, cotton and linen materials could no longer meet the demands for fiber in paper manufacture. Uh, so they needed some other source of it. In 1866, two guys named Watt and Burgess began producing paper from wood pulp. The wood pulp is obviously a lot cheaper 
right? It's, it's virtually unlimited and it's cheap source of cellulose fiber, but it had to be treated, obviously. So cellulose obtained from wood pulp is less durable, doesn't last as long, it's more acidic, and it has a lower molecular weight, which means that the chains are shorter, so it has less strength to start with, even though it's they're all aging, it has less strength even beginning. So the wood must be what we call delignified by chemical pulping processes. Not all lignin is removed, clearly. And as, then there's another thing called hemicelluloses, which are sort of half papers. Um, the other extraneous components are usually not removed, especially in what we call pulp paper, a paper of pulp fiction, right? They, they slowly degrade, particularly in the presence of oxygen to acidic products. Uh, the amount of residual lignin and hemicellulose con contained in resulting fibers is reflected in something we call the pulp yield. A high pulp yield indicates a relatively high content of lignin in hemicellulose, and the paper used in comic books is derived from a blend of groundwood pulp, which is like 80%, and unbleached craft pulp, like 25%. Uh, that, um, not of the total thing, but of that amount of pulp has unbleached craft pulp and, and the uh, groundwood pulp. So it has a large, large, large amount of lignin, which is just goo. It hasn't, it's not really good paper, it's, it's weak, it's brittle, it doesn't absorb ink, and it makes a lot of acid, right? So other sources of acidity in paper contain, or could, you know, if they're from the bleaching process, there's acid migration from book storage materials as the, as, such as cardboard, if you're in contact with cardboard, which is, you know, going to be super acidic. Uh, it is, I've, also, I've often seen that the inside cover of a comic book, like the, if you look at the cover, on the, on the splash pages that the uh, area around where the panels were is actually sort of more aged in the white border around the splash page and I don't quite understand that yet I'm trying to solve that mystery why that's the case um, so the cover in contact with where the ink is is more aged than the rest of it which doesn't make sense to me I'm trying to solve that one it's going to brown but it's, an, it's a complex problem of course so in summary, the manufacture of paper from wood pulp using a modern modern chemical techniques such as alum sizing, modern meaning 20th century, not really 21st century. Uh, over a period, they will they will have an initial pH of, of low, lower pH, like four to five a lot of times. Over a period of time, however, the pH will even decrease further locally through pollutants or from just natural impurities from the paper making process. Um, like we said before, this is one of the major, that this acid is a major source of the lysing, the cutting of the 1,4 beta glycosidic bonds in cellulose fiber and sort of the browning and brittleness of it. So that, my friends, is how we, um, that's how paper, the sources of acidity in paper. We're going to talk some of, about some of the effects of that. That's what happens. We're going to talk about the kinetics, what ha makes it happen faster. We're going to talk about temperature next time, and then we'll talk about the effects of oxygen and then the effects of light. Uh, there might be three separate videos or one super long video. So we'll see. Anyway, I hope you enjoy. Take care. Bye-bye.